G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. The trade period has kicked off and as such, we have some deals to talk about now. A number of deals that happened that, that we more or less knew were coming and then there's also some new details around other deals. Um, I, I always sit down to do a trade update thinking, is there enough for a full video here? And there's always enough, there's, there's heaps going on. So we're gonna unpack all of that before I get into it. I know I do this a lot, but I, I looked at how many different people have watched a YouTube video on the True Footy channel in the last 90 days, and look at this number. Different people have watched a video on this channel. First of all, thank you for checking out the channel. Um, but secondly, it would mean a lot to me if uh, anyone who is enjoying the content did consider subscribing. It would really help me grow the channel, and I do want to make this a really cool thing one day. So we have had a lot of people subscribe recently, so I do really appreciate that. And if there's anyone else out there, I would appreciate it if you did the same. Okay, let's talk about the deals that went down. So I think the first one, not that it really matters, but I think the first one chronologically was Alex Neil Bullen joining the Adelaide Crows. This one we probably saw coming as one of the first deals done. It was, um, you know, I think it was talked about ages ago and then sort of went quiet, which kind of implies that the deal's probably been done in principle for some time. I think Toomey was saying it was always going to be what is pick 28, um, the going the way of Melbourne. And Alex Neil Bullen joins the Adelaide Crows. So Adelaide emerging already as one of the more active teams this trade period. So they've got Isaac coming and they've got Alex Neil Bullen and we know they're expected to get James Peatling pretty soon. So it caps off a nice little period for them. Uh, one thing I've been banging on about, and I do repeat myself in videos a lot because I make so much content every day, but I think it's it's really good for Adelaide to, to really plug a bit of a gap in their list of, of players around this range. So in addition to them all being good talents, like Peatling had a great year. Neil Bullen finished third in Melbourne's best and fairest. That is outstanding. I know that Melbourne had a, you know, a bit of a car crash season, to be honest, and you know, Clayton Oliver's not the same player. P Petrarca also missed a heap of footy, but Neil Bullen did have a really good year this year as a bit of a midfield rotation. Obviously, he hits the scoreboard as well. And Isaac Cumming is a, is a really good underrated player, in my opinion. He's really quick and really skillful. So in addition to the talent, um, you know, one thing I've noticed that I have been repeating is that Adelaide are still one of the youngest teams in the comms. So they had three players in their prime. Maybe they don't, you know, revolutionize their midfield, which has been talked about as being a little bit one pace, perhaps. Peatling and Neil Bullen will still rotate through there. And Isaac coming, you know, if he plays on a wing, really adds a lot of speed out there. So got to give some credit to Adelaide, I think. This has been a pretty productive one. I think they were in the race for Perryman. I can't remember. But either way, they've got three pretty good targets and they hold pick four in this year's draft. Um, pick 28, which has gone to Melbourne, uh, was originally Melbourne's pick anyway because they traded that for Shane McAdam last year. So it just ends back at the original club. And essentially, the Crows have turned Shane McAdam into Neil Bullen, which I think is good business. I do want to talk about Melbourne uh, later on in this video around some pick swaps that they might be doing because it'll be interesting to watch given what they did last year. But let's put a pin in that for now. The other deal that got done was Jack Darling. Uh, he joined North Melbourne. We saw this coming. Uh, if you want some extensive thoughts, A, I have uh, True Eagle and Eagles channel where I, I, I'm probably going to do a video very soon on that. But I also... Uh, was a guest on the Further North podcast uh, earlier today. That should be up by now, so go check it out, particularly you North Melbourne fans. A great podcast for all things North Melbourne. But a, a shrewd move for Darling, I think, uh, with North Melbourne. Helps structurally, bit of leadership. Again, I'm probably repeating myself a little bit here. The deal is now formally done, so both clubs can move on to other deals that they got involved in. West Coast are pretty active. North Melbourne's still in the hunt for Dan Houston, which we will also get to. Jack Graham has also decided on West Coast. I don't think paperwork has been lodged. Um, I Again, I think this is a pretty good move for West Coast. I don't think he's going to be an A-grade talent or anything like that for a number of reasons uh, around our list demographic. It makes sense. Again, I talk about this in more detail on the True Eagle channel. For Richmond, I, I think this is far from ideal, to be honest. And I know, and I've read like Richmond fan opinions on this, and some of them are happy to get rid of Graham. But I think if you just look at the net in versus out, um, you know, players leaving like Rioli, Bolton, and Baker for a start. Um, Graham is the one where they might not get a whole lot. So we don't know what the compensation is going to be for Richmond, but I don't think it's going to be significant. So I think Graham falls under the category of a player that I really would have rather have kept purely just for the stability of their team and a midfield rotation of mature body to protect what is going to be a very young midfield, I think over the next couple of seasons. But anyway, it's happened. It is what it is. And Graham gets to the Eagles. We also saw a formal trade request from Joe Richards. We didn't know how this was going to go. And I think as time went further on, Port Adelaide's chances were increasing. And in fact, he has requested a trade to the power now, um, which surprised me a little. I mean, i got to say, like a, a Victorian player drafted by Collingwood offered three years at both clubs. They probably didn't see it coming that Port Adelaide would land him. So that's, that's good business by them. 
On the other hand, I do have to wonder, it's interesting to see a guy who's played nine games for six goals get a three-year contract and have two teams fighting over him. To be fair, I have watched him play and I've seen some really good signs and he was really good against West Coast, kicked a good goal against us. So not necessarily criticizing. It was just interesting the value placed on a nine-gamer. Um, but either way, a bit of a blow for Collingwood. Obviously, they've got their own um, moves to consider as well. They're right in the hunt for Dan Houston, which we'll get to, and perhaps this is all tied in. So on Houston, um, I think I previously said that Carlton and North Melbourne were the two main contenders at this point. Um, I don't think anyone's fully ruled out. Like I read that the Demons and the Bulldogs, to some extent, still have some interest. I'm not sure where St Kilda sits in this. However, Collingwood has emerged as a major contender here, and a little bit like the Perryman situation where um, they emerged late and eventually got him and you know by the nature of it being Collingwood I think they're always going to be a team that can attract these players so I think they're going to be a serious contender here so where it sits currently is that Gold Coast pick 13 might be the key here because that's what Carlton's trying to require to send to Port Adelaide to get Houston and now Collingwood are here so what probably gives Collingwood the edge over Carlton specifically is that Gold Coast apparently according to Craig Cameron their list manager said it's possibly more likely they're going to deal with Collingwood here for pick 13. He didn't necessarily lock it in, but because they're already dealing with John Noble, which is something I said in a video the other day, if they're already dealing with Collingwood for John Noble, it probably makes it easier for Collingwood to sneak in, trade their future first, which is possibly going to be absorbed by Tom McGuan in next year's draft anyway. Gold Coast get a future first and pick 13 gets to Collingwood. Could they flip that for Houston? The thing is in all this, Port Adelaide can still say no to Gold Coast first round pick. I don't know how likely it is that they say yes to it, to be honest. Um, pick 13 on its own for a contracted Dan Houston, when you've got Liam Baker uncontracted going for potentially pick 14, as it's being reported. Dual Australian, it doesn't make sense that pick 13 on its own would be enough. So I'm still a little bit confused how this is going. I think it's a distinct possibility he stays at Port Adelaide. But North Melbourne have the nicest offer to Port Adelaide. So they're still a contender by virtue of the fact that they can trade their future first to Port. The Port can then say, hey, Houston, if you want to go now, it's North Melbourne or no one. So still really hard to, to see where this is at, although Collingwood has probably emerged. That's probably the story today. Now, as for Melbourne and that pick swap. So for the first time, I've seen interest from Melbourne in free, one of Fremantle's first three picks. So it says Melbourne has interest in trading its future first round pick for one of Fremantle's first round selections this year, as the Demons look to double up on talent in the upcoming draft. This is a year after what they did last year where they traded a whole heap of picks and, and moved up the order to get 6 and 11, um, which from memory, I don't remember the specifics, but I remember they probably left some value on the table there. They only wanted their two picks of kids they rated, and uh, presumably they got them. I don't know exactly which two they were looking for, but Windsor and Tholstrup were the guys they ended up with. So they're looking to double down on this year's draft. It's a stronger draft, and I do kind of like the impetus here from Melbourne trying to be proactive they're looking at a list that is not necessarily really old but aging to some extent and if things you know go tits up with Clayton Oliver and Max Gorn retires in a couple of years they might be in a position where they're like oh look at all these draft picks we've taken in the last few years so I do get that from their perspective how this all works is interesting here so Fremantle's motivation might be to trade it into next year's first round uh, for two reasons first of all it's got to be around Chad Warner. There's got to be a belief they can get Chad Warner. And I think Chad Warner returning to Western Australia is entirely possible based on what we're hearing. Um, I don't know how Fremantle is going to feel if they trade for a future first and he just ends up going to West Coast. So this implies some, some confidence, in my opinion, in my opinion. But I think it will hinge on Shea Bolton. So if Fremantle give two first round picks to Richmond for Shea Bolton, say it's 11 and 18 or 10 and 18, wherever it sits right now. Do they then trade their first round pick that's remaining for Melbourne's future first? Yeah, it's possible, like if they're really keen on Chad Warner. It's a strong draft to trade out of. So I don't know if they trade entirely out of the first round. Perhaps it's contingent on them keeping at least an extra first rounder as per the Shea Bolton deal, or perhaps a contingency if they miss out on Bolton altogether. So that's gonna be interesting. The other motivation for Fremantle here is that Melbourne, we don't know what pick they're trying to get from Fremantle, but Melbourne finished fifth last this year. So where do we project that future first is going to land? I mean, you could easily make the case that Melbourne, if you, if you predict them to finish top four next year, like I probably wouldn't fight you that hard on it because they're still in a good position. Probably not my prediction. You'd think that improve from fifth last, but it could be juicy here for Fremantle. It could be a difference. Let's say it's pick 18 that they trade to Melbourne or even pick 11. I mean, they could roll the dice on 11 
that it could be an improvement on 11. It would certainly be an improvement on 18. My point is there, without muddying the waters too much, they could roll the dice on Melbourne having another bad year, which is not beyond the realm of possibility either. So that would be an interesting one to watch how this plays out. Melbourne are also having a real dip at Gold Coast pick 13. All the same logic still applies. Moving on to the Western Bulldogs and Riley Garcia. So apparently the Bulldogs have increased its offer for Riley Garcia. We previously discussed the fact that he's out of contract at the Dogs and um, was being courted by Port Adelaide and West Coast specifically with a couple of years on the table, I think, from both of those clubs. However, they have now offered him three years. I think this is a good move. As a, as a West Coast fan who wants Garcia to some extent, at West Coast, I think the Bulldogs should probably place some value on a guy that finished second, I think, in Footscray's best and fairest and seventh in the Liston Trophy, which is uh, the best and fairest for the competition. Average 30 disposals a game in the VFL, which just couldn't quite crack a regular game at the Western Bulldogs in the AFL side. Bailey Smith and McRae are leaving. Um, you know, obviously Liberatore is not a young man anymore. And I personally think it's unlikely they're going to get Xavier O'Halloran. So therefore, I think there's real need there for Garcia, or at least a desire there to, to keep Garcia. And that's being reflected by the new contract. Port Adelaide's probably getting Joe Richards now. So is it just a case of West Coast or Western Bulldogs? Either way, I think where this is going is that Riley Garcia signs on with the Bulldogs. A little bit on North and Caleb Daniel. It just says that North and the Western Bulldogs remain in the dark on what Caleb Daniel's plans are for the future. And uh, it also says, as a side note, the Bulldogs and St Kilda are yet to even negotiate for Jack McRae. So I think I think both clubs will probably have their hands full. Ooh, nice voice break. Both clubs will have their uh, hands full with different deals. St Kilda probably looking at a trade around some draft picks as well. But it does say North Melbourne will extend Caleb Daniels' current contract by a further two years. So four years at North Melbourne. I like this move from North Melbourne, depending on the cost, obviously. We don't really have any indication on that. But Mitch Cleary is saying it's a four-year deal potentially on the table. So you can see immediately why Caleb Daniel, without the same job security at the Western Bulldogs, would probably be very tempted by a four-year deal. For the first time, we've seen some interest in Ethan Phillips. Ethan Phillips is a Hawthorne key defender who I think they signed as an SSP player at the start of this year out of the VFL as being one of the best performed players in the VFL from memory. Good state league level key back. This was uh, in light of um, an injury to James Blank in particular. However, Hawthorne have signed Josh Battle. They're almost certainly going to get Tom Barris, so potentially Ethan Phillips, who is without a contract, could sign somewhere else, and it could be as a delisted free agent. It does say that Carlton and St Kilda are understood to hold some interest. This is from the AFL website, um, and uh, you know I'd imagine they're probably not the only two clubs. They're the only two clubs named, but key backs do kind of go at a bit of a premium, or you know at least garner some real interest this time of year as clubs look at depth. So Ethan Phillips is a watch. I reckon he'll end up at a different club. We also had cold water portal over the Clayton Oliver situation, which is a story I've discussed a little bit on this channel here. So um, we know Melbourne at the best and fairest pretty much ruled a line through it. And uh, I think today, Tim Lamb said that Clayton Oliver was never offered for trade at any stage. So I don't know. There's a lot of misinformation going around. So I don't know to what extent that's true. Either way, I think we can accept it's not happening this year. And even Andrew Mackey said, Clayton's manager was aware it might be in his best interest to have a chat, but it was pretty brief. As far as we're concerned, it was fleeting. We are respectful of Melbourne and their stance. We will put it to bed. So yeah, probably not going to happen this year. I've seen crazier things happen than Clayton Oliver backflipping and leaving. Like it is possible because of the nature of trade period, but for the most part, we can probably just about put it to bed. However, Ask me again in 12 months. Um, we'll see. It's a big year for Clayton and the Melbourne Football Club, that's for sure. And finally, a little bit of a tidbit on uh, Jake Stringer. So the last thing we left it as, as was GWS are probably the only interested club at the moment outside of Essendon, where he has another year to go on a contract. Essendon are unwilling to extend that. So I just saw from Cal Toomey, he just said it in passing that he thinks Stringer is keen to get to GWS, which makes me think, well, why wouldn't it happen then? If he is willing to move interstate to get a prolonged contract and a longer career potentially, are we expecting Essendon to put up too much of a fight? Are Essendon going to be happy to, to move him on? And we know they've got some interest in Connor Stone as well. Uh, I'm not saying that's a perfect swap like for like, but my point there is it's interesting to me that String is keen to move interstate. That would have been the first question I asked. And if he is, then I think it's quite possible he gets to the Giants who have bled players this offseason once again and I could see them going for a mature talent in Jake Stringer. But anyway guys that is all I got for you today. Let me know in the comments what you think and I'll be back probably tomorrow for another trade update. Thanks I'll see you in the next one.